Praise the Lord. Can we give the Lord a hand, cup of praise? Amen. Amen. Uh, so my name is Chris Delmage. I'm the senior pastor of Hempstead Assembly of God in Hempstead, New York, Hempstead, Long Island. And it is indeed a privilege and an honor to be here with you. Uh, my wife and children would have been here, but uh, we all got hit with COVID. And my kids said they missed too many days of school. They so, hey, I'll take it. And uh, so, but they do send their love. And I want to give God thanks and praise for your pastor, Pastor Bob. I just think you are just an amazing man of God and a brother. Uh, even now, I'm sitting there taking communion. I'm saying, okay, uh, I can go home because he just ministered to my heart <laughs> about the garden. And, and so it's that simple um, throughout the years of just uh, getting to know him more and more, simple conversations. I don't think he has any idea of how he has a powerful gift of shepherding and shepherding other pastors. And so please understand anything that you see in this church building and anything that he does, I just take it and I bring it to Hempstead and um, they love me for it and they think I got it. But nonetheless... Let the word be known, let the word go out, that it all comes from Pastor Bob, but nonetheless. Uh, bow your heads with me. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. I just want to jump right into this word. Father, I thank you, God, for all that you're doing. Thank you, God, for an opportunity just to share your word, God, and I pray that your Holy Spirit will hit the bullseye uh, this morning. Do what you do well. I thank you, God, for this opportunity to share. Be with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And so... Uh, to tell you the truth, the, the source of this word, the source of this word comes from a place of frustration. I'll just be honest with you, just frustrated. Um, you now, as we were approaching uh, 2022, I was looking forward to having a new season and doing new things and everything's great. We went out of our way and, and we usually have a huge uh, New Year's Eve service. And so we're planning this service and we're going to worship God because we're finally getting out of all of this garbage and we're entering into something new and we're excited. I'm excited. I'm having visions. I'm thinking what God is going to do. And December 30th, we had to shut everything down because of COVID. Everybody, almost everybody got it. Every person that's in any type of leadership position in our church, I had it, my entire family had it, praise and worship team, the entire praise and worship team had it, all of the AV personnel, the elders, it was almost every, whether you got vaccinated or not, you got it. And I didn't know it was going to affect me the way that it did. Have you ever been in a situation where you thought you would be able to handle something only to find out that you couldn't? And not only that, but because you're the pastor, you're supposed to have all the answers. And because you're the parent, you're supposed to know what to do next. And, and you find yourself totally overwhelmed because what you thought you prepared yourself for really hit you harder than you thought emotionally, mentally, and dare I say, even spiritually. I found myself uh, in my room uh, and it was like, the thought process was, I cannot believe we're going to go through this again. And at the same time, you know what the word of God says. At the same time, you recognize the power of the gospel. And he sent his son. And he's empowered you. You are the head and not the tail. You are above and not beneath. But have you ever been in a situation where even those words seem to not do enough for you right now? And I was upset. I was really upset. My wife saw it, my kids saw it, and so I found myself in the back of the room in, in my little study there in the parsonage, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm just, just trying to get through this, this, this time. We had to do a couple of funerals because people died, and people were in ICU, and they were hooked up to respirator, and I said, not again, Lord. And I remember my prayers starting to change, saying, Lord, enough. Please, God, time out. Blow the whistle. Stop. Please. And I was just going, and then the Holy Spirit I believe it was the Holy Spirit began to minister me with this one passage of scripture, James chapter one, verse two. And this is what it says. It says, consider it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And I hate this scripture. I grew up in a pastor's home, and so this was my father's go-to scripture. Oh, someone has hits your car in your parking lot, and what do you say? Count it all joy. <laughs> you lost your job, what does he say? Count it all joy. You lost your eye, he says, count it all joy. 
And I couldn't understand why my father, you know, man of God, everything was all about uh, God will work all things together for good to them. I'm like, "Mm, I don't know how to handle this. And so here I am praying to the Lord, asking him to blow the whistle, saying, time out. I don't need any more stuff. And I hear the Holy Spirit say, count it all joy. Am I by myself here to be the Christian in the office and you want to throw stuff, but you know that's going to mess up your witness and testimony and you hear the Holy Spirit say, count it all joy. And here's what happened when I was reading this uh, scripture and just trying to deal with my emotions for the first time in all these years of pastoring, all of, of these years being in my dad's house, for the first time, it's like the Holy Spirit allowed me to see this scripture differently because my frustration was, was, was being produced from this place of looking at the word joy, but that's not the focus of this scripture. The focus of the scripture deals with these three other words. Check this out. Consider it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you encounter various trials, knowing, knowing, I was frustrated that God wanted me to smile while we go through the divorce. I was angry because God wanted me to smile while I'm uh, bearing another loved one. I was angry with God. He wants me to smile now that I got uh, fired from my job. But it's not so much about the joy as much as it is about the knowing. The knowing. My first point is joyfully knowing. That word know is genosko in the Greek, and what it actually means is to be an intimately uh, acquainted with something, intimately to have intimate knowledge of something, and usually that knowledge is produced because of repetition. It's because you're constantly in the situation, you're constantly in the area, you're constantly in that person's face, and now you're, you're, you're intimately aware of who they are. I've been with my wife since 1992, and uh, since I was 16 years old. Now, here's the thing. I fell in love with her the first time I met her when I was 14, and she discovered me when she was 17. <laughs> d- d- listen... Those three years can be categorized in some circles as stalking. I say it was just deep infatuation, but, but, but nonetheless, it all worked out. Praise the Lord. It all worked out. She got tired, and so there it is. So, so senior year, senior year, we're, we're, we're together, and, and we've been together since 1992. I, I need to let you know we are intimately aware of who we are with each other. I have knowledge, genosco, of who she is. She has knowledge, genosco, of who I am. When you're dealing with genosco, you're almost able to finish the other person's sentences. When you're dealing with genosco, you are fully aware of their type of humor. No one else in the room will get it except the person that genoscos you. And and that's how it is with my wife. Listen, genosco creates the opportunity where you can actually have a sense of what's going to happen next. Genosco. You can anticipate behavior. Genosco. I love giving gifts. I'm a gift giver. My wife knows this. She was raised in a home where they didn't really do much gifts, but when we started dating, when we got married, she knows I go nuts for birthdays and Valentine's Day and anniversary. And so one year, I, I felt like, well, there's a terminology I did. I felt like she was sweating me too much. And so I was going to make her, you know, kind of, you know, she knows I'm going to get her something. So this year, I'm like, nah, Valentine's Day, I'm acting like what? It's just a day. <laughs> Whatever. You know, whatever. And I go throughout the whole day not mentioning anything. No flowers, no candy, no chocolates, nothing. It was a busy day in church. I had a couple of meetings and had to do some counseling, this and that. And I go and I pick her up from work. Nothing, nothing. She has no attitude with me. I'm shocked. Because, guys, you know what I'm saying? At least if they're upset, that means they're still engaged. But if there's nothing, that's when I got concerned. I get to the door and, 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 and I get to the door to our apartment. We're still living in, in, in the apartment area of my, my dad's home. And, and I open the door. She goes, okay, I'm ready for it. I'm like, what? Oh, stop. It's Valentine's Day. There's, oh my gosh, it's Valentine's Day? She said, whatever. Okay, what is it? It's going to be what? Rose petals on the ground, right? There's going to be what? Candy and chocolate. And then you're also going to have, what, a dozen peach roses? She opens up the door and there's rose petals on the ground. (laughs) 
Genosco. Genosco creates the opportunity where you're able to anticipate the next step. You are intimately aware of this individual. The Bible says, consider it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you encounter various trials, knowing there is no joy unless you are intimately aware of who God is. There's had to be situations in your life where time and time again, at the end of the day, God comes through. There's got to be moments in your life where you actually saw the gospel played out because God never fails. He doesn't sleep. He doesn't know how to lose. He's always there. He's always been there. You can go back in your mind. As difficult as this current season is right now, you can go back in your mind and find some place where God dropped the ball. And you can't. The power of this verse is taking what you do know about God and bringing it into your present. That's what produces the joy. However, what if you are not as intimate with him as you thought? See? Thus bringing you to a place where the only way you get to know God is to experience God in different situations. Knowing. Consider it all joy. So you know what I want you to do? Forget about the word joy for a moment, and let's concentrate on the concept of intimately getting to know God. Intimately knowing God. Genosco. Consider it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you encounter various trials knowing. When you see that word trials in scripture, that word trials, it actually, it actually, dakimatso, it actually means testing, stretching, and pulling, pushing you to your limits so that you can discover who you really are. And now produces that knowing, the genosco, the knowing piece. Here's the second thing that is just, the Bible says, knowing that the testing of your faith produces something. Unless you are aware that God is still working in the midst of your situation, I've been through too much. How about you? 2019, 2020, 2021, I could be honest and tell you I've been through too much. I could be honest to tell you I've done too many funerals. I could be honest to let you know I felt like my mind at times, I was slipping. I saw moments where sitting at the table, my, my kids would see me crying, and you're trying to explain to them what's happening. There's things happening in the country. There's things happening in your city. There's things happening in your family. There's things that are happening in your body, and it feels like you're being stretched. You're being pulled, and that's what testing is. That is actually the definition of it. You didn't know you were able to go through it, and yet you did, and here's the best part. You are still here. See? You're still here. I'm still here. Tears and all, I'm still here. You're still able to move forward. And there's a part of you that swore you wouldn't make it the next year, and yet here you are. A part of you didn't think you had enough power. A part of you didn't think you had enough strength. A part of you didn't think you had enough grace, but you're still here. You've been stretched, you've been pulled, you've been pressed. You're still here. So the Bible lets me know that there's, there's something that's being produced every single time your faith is being tested. Dokominion means to prove. It's just stretching. You don't know who you are until you are tested. Everything of value is tested. You know, um, when I first started playing football, I come, once again, I come from a pastor's family, so old school holiness, old school Pentecostal family, and so really you just can't do anything, right? So, <laughs> so, so I ended up going to high school and, and found out that I'm pretty fast, and so I decided to join the football team. And, Really faster than I thought, faster than I looked, fastest guy on the team. And so, so we're playing football, and one of the things that they did was they, they bring you down to the weight room where you start to you know, lift weights. And so everybody's looking at this guy, so, oh, look at big man, oh, look at big man, oh, big man, big man. And, but they, what they don't know, this is all just natural country big. <laughs> this, is, this is peanut butter and jelly and milk big. Right? There's absolutely no weight training whatsoever. And so, so when they see your size, they immediately assume this guy is going to go nuts. And so there they go. There's the bench press. And they put 135 pounds on the bench press. That's the bar and 245s. And there's this pretty boy. His name was Angel. His name is Angel, and he's a pretty boy. <laughs> and Angel goes on the bench. He said, and he bang, he starts banging him out. Oh, and he puts it on. All right, big man, your turn. Big man, your turn. Now, here's the thing. I've never used a bench press in my life. But as far as I'm concerned, if Angel 
can do it. I can do it. So I get on the bench, no type of uh, muscle coordination, nothing, never did it before. I pick this thing up, they let go. I lose balance, embarrassing, hits my chest, plates fall off. And the look on their faces was confusion. They didn't know if they should laugh. They couldn't believe someone so big. It's only 135 pounds, and I was so embarrassed. Because here's the thing. You, you think you can handle something until it's under you, you see. And some of us go to God and say, God, why is this happening? God, why now? Because there's a part of you that, that we need to see your value. You need to know your value. And everything of value is tested. The coach looked at me. He says, Delmatch, come here. So, he says, so, so you, you, you've never worked out before? And I have to, you know, that's the, you have to say it in front of all the other guys. No, not really. Uh, and so he begins to set up this training regimen. Now, here's the, here's, the, here's the worst part. The training regimen required me to begin the bench pressing sets with just the bar. <laughs> Do you know what it's like when the tennis team, the female tennis team comes in to the weight room and big man like me has the bar? And of course, the friends that I had, no one is gracious. I said, hey, need help with that? And so it's a very embarrassing season when you are lifting weights with just the bar. But listen to what I got to tell you. Do not underestimate the value of your seasons of humility. Do not underestimate the value of the seasons of humility where God is allowing you to go through certain things, allowing you to, to experience certain types of pressure, not because he hates you, but he's developing things in you that you did not know you needed. And so I had to learn how to lift. I had to learn how to lift properly. And even though it was embarrassing at first, guess what? There was strength there. It just wasn't activated. And the only way it was able to be activated was I had to find myself in a situation where there was a testing going on so I can discover what I am and who I am. How many of you know what I'm talking about now? You didn't know you knew how to pray until you had to pray and your life depended on it. In those seasons of humility, those seasons where you might have lost people that you thought would always be there for you, in those seasons where people started to speak against you and you had no idea why, in those seasons where you relied heavily on this job or you relied heavily on this check only because, you know, that's the only thing you've ever known. And then in those seasons, you discovered God. That's when you discovered who Jehovah Jireh was. That's who you discovered who Jehovah Rapha was. That's who you discovered Jehovah Shammah, the God who's always there. And you're never alone. And it wasn't until that season of humility. And so, yeah, in no time, Angel was still doing 135. But because things started to work together, and I said, oh, that's what a pec muscle is. And all of a sudden, things started working. And then we're banging out two, 225, 250, 275, 310. That, all of a sudden, it's like, oh, big man. But I never forgot the day when it was just the bar. Y'all ready? And so when all of a sudden, when the coach wants to add more weight, I don't go, ah. But I know, Janosko that if I continue on this projection, I'll be able to lift that too. All of a sudden, the adding of resistance isn't making me upset. The adding of resistance is saying, no doubt, coach, I'll do that because Janosko, been here, done that. I remember when it was just the bar, but I followed the instructions and I've gotten strong. Anybody know what I'm talking about now? See? Janosko changes, and out of Janosko comes what? Joy. Here's my last point. He says, and, and, and all of a sudden, I don't hate this verse as much anymore. Consider it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you encounter various trials. Now, listen, honestly, by a show of hands, how many of you have encountered various trials in these last couple of years? Raise your hands. Let everyone else see so they don't think you're the only one. See, I love to do that. People come up into a church building and a worship service trying to act all, no, stop it. We all go through some stuff. 
We've been through some things. And he says, I want you to count all joy because the testing of this, this, this faith is producing uh, endurance. Producing endurance. Here's my last word. Joyfully enduring. Your faith is producing something only when it's tested. Your faith is producing something only when it's tested. And that word endurance, <laughs> hypomony, it actually means the ability to not quit. It's the ability to not quit. It's interesting because I never thought that I would need this ability if God is omnipresent, if God is omnipotent, I thought he'll just carry the weight all by himself. I wasn't aware that I need to be a part of this process where endurance matters. And when I say endurance, it's the ability for you and I to not quit. It means we're going to be stubborn and, and remain. No matter what happens, I'm not going to curse God. No matter what happens, I'm not going to give up. No matter what happens, I'm not going to leave your presence, God. I'm staying, I'm staying, I'm staying. And some of us thought that happens automatically. You didn't realize it required a testing of your faith. See, you thought you got saved and everything was cool. No, that's just the beginning. There's something that God is doing in you and it produces. Can I tell you something? My dad prays every morning at 5 a.m. and preaches at 6 a.m. Completely nuts. He's been doing this since my freshman year in Bible college. And my father, who God bless him, he's 78 years old, preaches every single day. Do you know how hard it is to live up to that? I just want <laughs> And I, I hated being awakened at 4 o'clock in the morning to drive to Brooklyn because he's going to open up the church and pray. And, and you feel so small because you just can't keep up with this old man. And I'm like, ah, and I never forget when I, when, when I finally went and I, I was in another church. I said, let me tell you something, folks. If you guys think we're going to pray in the morning, <laughs> I got news for you. My, my mornings belong to me. And I never would even just entertain that. And then COVID. <laughs> and we had so many nurses in our in, in, in our church, so many doctors were in our church, and we are literally maybe three or four miles away from the epicenter in Nassau County of all of these cases when it happened in 2020. And so I kept getting phone calls from nurses and doctors. They said they're losing, they can't take it. I'm praying with them and praying. And finally, I said, hey, guys, listen, we're going to go on a conference line at 5 a.m., and we're going to pray, oh my God, pastor, what an incredible idea. And I'm like, oh my gosh. If my dad finds out about this. And now all of a sudden, it's only supposed to be like all the doctors, all the nurses, all the frontline workers. We're just going to pray with your pastor and yada, yada. And next thing you know, people started hearing about it in church. And then the church calls into the prayer line. And then all of a sudden, people are like, oh my God, I got to tell my auntie in Jamaica. And you got people from Jamaica calling and people from the Barbados calling. And now all of a sudden, on this prayer line, there's people say, oh my gosh, I can't wait for prayer. Sometimes it takes going through something for parts of you to be activated. Because I can't give up. I've come too far by faith. I can. That's what it says. Count it all joy. And then for the last two and a half years, we've been praying at five o'clock in the morning and we've seen people get healed on the phone. People who've never set foot inside of our church building getting delivered. We had this one incredible woman. She, they, they told her to abort her baby because she was pregnant with twins and her heart would not, her, her heart will not function. They told her, you are going to have a heart attack. You're going to die. Your twins are going to die. And she comes on the line. She says, I'm believing that God, she just gave her heart to the Lord. I'm believing that God is going to save me and my children. Pastor, church, can you pray with me? We prayed with her throughout eight months of that pregnancy, sometimes in the hospital room, sometimes hearing the machine beeping, sometimes she's breathing because she can't breathe. And oh my gosh, we heard the babies crying. She gave birth. And then when, when, when things, when the restrictions lifted, she came to the church. I didn't even know who this woman was because we've never seen her before. 
I don't even know who she is. And, and at the end of service one day, I see this woman in the back of the sanctuary. She has, you know, just the baby, the, the two twins. I said, hello, how are you? And what's your name? She told me, oh, that's wonderful. How, how did you hear about this? And she mentioned two women in the church. I said, that's wonderful. Listen, we have a welcome set in the back, yada, yada, and I'm walking away. And I go, wait, wait, are you? And she tells, I go, what? And I run back, the totally broke protocol, run right back up to the stage, grab the rifle, hey, everybody stop, stop, stop. Do you know who that is? And everybody starts screaming. She's never set foot in the church building before, but we knew her, we loved her, we loved her children. And all of a sudden, God was allowing something new to happen because of testing, testing. Are you about to give up because of testing? Let me end, I'm gonna end with this. And, the praise and worship team can come up. You know, I'm a big guy. And I said, Lord, there's got to be something more you're going to do with this frame besides preaching. So I tried Muay Thai boxing, right? <laughs> I said, there's got to be something else. And I never forget signing up for this class at a UFC gym. There's a UFC gym uh, near my home. And I'm saying, okay, great. And I spent money on these gloves. I spent money on these wraps. I spent money on all of these things because you know what? In a year or two, I should be able to, you know, do what I got to do. And so I signed up for this class. And I'm thinking we're going to learn how to do a jab and an uppercut and a roundhouse and all these wonderful things. And I'm excited about this. And for the first two weeks, all we do is run. <laughs> we're running, we're running, we're running in circles. We're running inside the octagon. We're running, we're running. We're doing this horrible thing that I believe Satan created himself called burpees. We're jumping up and coming down. We're jumping up and coming down. I think it's demonic. I don't believe in it. <laughs> and we're doing this for about a week and a week and a half. And I'm like, listen, I did not sign up for track. I wanted to do boxing. <laughs> and, 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 and I decided to go to the instructor at the end of the you know, second week. And I go to the instructor and say, hey, yeah, yeah I'm really considering um, dropping out of the class. It's not really what I was expecting. I thought we would be doing a lot more boxing. And this is what the trainer said to me that made me now appreciate and embrace James chapter 1. He said, the reason why we're doing so much cardio is that your body is incapable of doing what I need to teach you. I said, excuse me? He says, you're out of shape. <laughs> you're out of shape. And the only way that I can teach you how to properly stand, it's going to require you to be repetitious without getting tired. The only way I can teach you how to properly block, the only way I can teach you how to properly throw a jab without your, without your arms drooping, without your bed, because you need to be able to have the stamina. You need to be able to endure the teaching so that I can teach you how to do it properly. And I said, oh. And then that's when I dropped out because yeah, that's too much work. <laughs> but, but here's the thing. Do you recognize that there are things that you and I are going through? Verse 4 says, and let endurance have its perfect work. Let endurance have its perfect endurance. In other words, get out of the way and allow endurance to do the work so that you would be equipped ready for every work, for everything that needs to happen. Some of us in this room right now, we've gone through seasons just so that we can develop the cardio so that God can begin to teach us new things for a new season that we're about to get into. He couldn't give you this word until you went through what you went through so that you now have an attitude of no matter what happens, I'm not quitting. No matter what happens, I'm not giving up. No matter what happens, I'm not letting go of you, God. No matter what happens, I'm not leaving. No matter what happens, God, I'm oppressing even more. And it's that attitude that God needed inside of you so that you can be ready for this next season. I'm letting you know endurance is joyful. Bow your heads with me. Dear Heavenly Father, I just pray, oh God, that even with this short time of speaking your word, that Father, we recognize that the things we went through was not to destroy us, but it was designed to empower us. The things that we had to endure was producing a no-quit attitude so that we can receive even something greater. God, you are awesome. 
and I thank you for the power of the, the word. The thank you, God, for the power of the gospel. And that, Lord, you keep your promises. And so, Father, for each and every person that is hurting, for each and every person that is confused, with each and every person that's wondering, when will this end? I pray that your Holy Spirit will speak into their hearts and that they'll begin to see you working. Because, Father, the testing of their faith is producing endurance. I thank you, God because I can be joyful now and I anticipate you working and moving even in greater ways in Jesus' name, amen. All right.